Hello, today we're continuing with our series on GCSE physics revision and we are now going to look at radioactivity. In the last video I explained that elements were defined by the number of protons in their nucleus. So an element is defined by its number of protons and this is the way we write the information about a particular element. I'm going to take carbon. Carbon has a letter which is, as it were, its abbreviation, the letter C for carbon. And carbon happens to have six protons in its nucleus. So we put the six to the left and downstairs. Now these two things mean the same thing. If it's carbon, it has to have six protons. If it's got six protons, it has to be carbon. So really this is duplication. You could, it can't be anything other than that combination. The number that we put at the top on the left hand side is the number of protons plus neutrons. So you can easily work out how many neutrons there are simply by subtracting the bottom number from the top number. So clearly there are six neutrons because there are six protons and there are 12 protons plus neutrons. So obviously the number of neutrons is going to be 6. This number 12 we often call the mass number and I've, as I've said that's equivalent to the number of protons and the number of neutrons. This number we call the atomic number and that as I've said is purely equal to the number of protons. Now I want to introduce you to a thing called an isotope with a P. An isotope is an element where you have the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. If you have the same number of protons it means it's the same element but if it has a different number of neutrons it means it's an isotope of that element. For example you can have carbon which of course must have six protons that's non-negotiable but you can have say a mass number of 14 which implies, of course, that there are eight neutrons in carbon because the difference, this is protons plus neutrons. If you subtract the number of protons, you get eight neutrons. So carbon-12 and carbon-14 are isotopes. They have the same number of protons, but they have differing number of neutrons. This version of carbon, carbon-12, is called, is stable because it doesn't decay. This version of carbon is radioactive. It decays. And the reason it does is because it's got slightly too many neutrons in its nucleus in order to maintain stability. And it needs to decay in order to get into a more stable atomic state. So radioactivity is a process whereby unstable atoms, unstable isotopes, decay. Sometimes they decay into stable atoms, in which case all is well. Sometimes they decay into other unstable atoms and then they decay again. Whenever atoms decay they give off radiation, which might be called alpha or beta or gamma. The reason that it's given those three names, which is the first, Greek letters, uh, th first three letters of the Greek alphabet, is that when this radiation was first detected nobody had the faintest idea what it was and so they simply labelled it by these three Greek letters. How did we know that there were three different types? Well it was quite simple you put the radiation through an electric field so you connect this maybe to a battery so this is positively charged this is negatively charged and then you just let the three types of radiation travel through it now it turns out that the gamma radiation, or the gamma rays, well they just went straight through. They were not affected by the electric field. Alpha particles, it turns out, very slightly deviated towards the negative plate. Beta particles, it turns out, strongly deviated towards the positive plate. Now this means that since we've learned that like charges repel, unlike charges attract, if an alpha particle is attracted to a negative plate, 
then the alpha particle must be positively charged because positive charges are attracted to a negative plate. Like charges repel, unlike charges attract. Similarly, if beta particles are attracted to a positive plate, they must be negatively charged. So we now know that the alpha particle is positively charged, the beta particle is negatively charged, and the gamma particle is not charged at all. Um, what are they? Well, whizzing through the years, an alpha particle is simply a helium nucleus. That is, a helium atom with both its electrons removed. Helium has two protons. Normally, it would have two electrons. But if you take them both away, you're just left with the helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons. And that is an alpha particle. A beta particle turns out to be nothing more than our good old friend, the ordinary electron. And the gamma ray is part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we dealt with earlier. You'll remember that it was at the far end of the electromagnetic spectrum with the highest frequency and lowest wavelength. It came above X-rays in the frequency spectrum and it's therefore the most dangerous of all the electromagnetic radiation. So, radioactivity is a situation where an unstable atom decays. And as it does, it emits radiation. Either alpha or beta or gamma, sometimes a combination. But here's the rub. That atom will decay at some point, but there is absolutely no way of predicting when it will decay and there is absolutely no way of hastening its decay. You cannot cause it to decay, and you cannot predict when it will decay. It has an entire mind of its own. It might decay in the next second. It might not decay for the next million years. If you take a large chunk of a material which is made up of unstable atoms, so there are all sorts of atoms here, you can say statistically that half of those atoms will decay in a certain time, and that time is called the half-life. We'll come on to this much later in another video. But essentially, you can always say that half of the atoms will decay in a certain time, and the half-lives differ from a fraction of a second to billions of years. But you can say after that time has gone by, half of the atoms will have decayed. That you can say. That's a statistical thing. It's about probability. But if you take any individual atom in that sample and say, when will that atom decay? There is absolutely no way of knowing. Now, radiation is all around us, which means that there are decaying atoms all around us, which means there are unstable atoms all around us. There is radiation in the air, there is radiation in food, there is radiation in buildings, in rocks, and indeed in space with things that are called cosmic rays, very, very high energy particles. Fortunately, on the Earth, we are generally in a situation where all this radiation, which is called background radiation, is very small. So it has a minimal effect on us, but it can still cause damage. And this is the reason all this radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, is what's called ionizing radiation. And we've come across this term before. Indeed, in the previous video, I spoke about ionizing an atom. It's when you knock an electron out of an atom and the atom is said to be ionized. It's then moderately um, positively charged because you've lost an electron. And all of these are capable of ionizing atoms. So when they hit something, they affect it by knocking an electron out. So if they enter your body, they are capable of doing things to the cells of your body because of that ionizing effect. And we'll look at that a bit later on. So let's just think about the features of these three different types of radiation. First, we'll look at the alpha radiation. As we said, it's positively charged. It's basically the helium nucleus which consists of two protons and two neutrons. And that, of course, is the reason it's positively charged, because it's got two positively charged protons. It's a big 
piece of radiation. It's a heavy helium nucleus and it therefore is quite slow. It has limited penetration. Indeed, you could stop alpha radiation with a piece of paper. But because it stops uh, so quickly, it's what's called strongly ionizing. You see, all of that energy in this big uh, piece of helium atom is being stopped very, very quickly in a piece of paper. And therefore, a lot of energy is being dispersed very quickly and that means it's strongly ionizing. It will kick lots of electrons out of atoms. So now let's look at beta particles, which are negatively charged because they are electrons, one and the same thing. They're very light. They are only one eight thousandth the mass of an alpha particle. Remember, they are one two thousandth the mass of a proton. And there are two protons and two neutrons in an alpha particle. So that means they're one eight thousandth the mass of an alpha particle. Protons and neutrons, broadly the same mass. And that means they're fast. They have moderate penetration. They would probably be stopped by a thin piece of aluminium. They are therefore long range and they're moderately ionizing. So if they hit you, they will have quite an effect in, as it were, kicking electrons out, but they're not as bad as alpha particles. And they are associated with quark changes. When neutrons change to protons or protons change to neutrons, you'll remember that happens because one up quark changes to a down or a down quark changes to an up. And that is associated with the emission of either positive electrons or negative electrons. So now we'll consider gamma rays, gamma particles, if you like. They have no charge. They are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in fact, gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation. They do not consist of any protons or neutrons or electrons. They have no mass. Effectively, the um, carrier of gamma rays are photons, just as photons are part of light. So photons of much higher energy are part of uh, gamma rays. They have extensive penetration. In fact, you need several centimeters of lead even to have a chance of stopping a gamma ray. And they're weakly ionizing because they penetrate so far that uh, they're not having a huge impact on the individual atoms they're going through. So there is a weak ionization, a weak attempt to knock electrons out of atoms. But the key point to remember about alpha, beta and gamma radiation is that they can all do damage. They can all affect your cells by this process of ionizing. They can cause the cells to mutate, which might lead to cancer. Or they can, if they're strong enough, just kill the cells. Obviously, in some cases, that could be beneficial in some form of medical treatments. But generally speaking, the thing you have to notice about this radiation and radioactivity in general is you need to take care when you're around it. You probably won't need to learn decay equations, but you will need to know how to balance them. So let me explain what I mean by that. If you take uranium, which you remember I said had 92 protons, and it has a combination of 238 protons and neutrons, that will eventually decay into thorium, which has 90 protons and 234 protons and neutrons, plus a helium nucleus, which is of course an alpha particle, so that is one and the same thing as an alpha particle, which you remember has two protons and a combination of four protons and neutrons, plus gamma radiation, which of course doesn't have any protons and it doesn't have any neutrons. Now you won't necessarily have to remember that, but you might be given the equation and there might be two numbers missing. For example, there might be that number might not be there and that number might not be there. And you will be asked to work out what those two numbers are. And it's all very simple. The numbers at the top need to add up on either side of the equation, and the numbers at the bottom need to add up on either side of the equation. In other words, 238 equals 234 
plus 4 plus 0. And at the bottom, 92 equals 90 plus 2 plus 0. So if the 234 were not there, and you were given that equation, you would say, well, I've got 238 on this side. I've only got 4 on this side. What's missing? 234. So that's the number there. Similarly, if the number 2 were missing there, you would say, well, I've got 92 on this side. I've got 90 on this side. I'm missing 2, so the 2 must be there. An equation for beta radiation uses our good old friend carbon-14. So carbon has 6 protons, and in this case, 14 proton protons plus neutrons. And that decays into nitrogen, which has 7 protons and 14 protons plus neutrons, plus the electron, or the beta particle, which of course has no protons and electrons, but it does have a charge of minus one. So we put that down there. It doesn't mean to say it's got minus one proton. That's just a way of showing it has a charge of minus one, which is of course the electron. Plus, I told you that there is also an anti-neutrino formed, but that doesn't have any protons or any neutrons. So what has actually happened is that in the carbon decay, one of the neutrons has been converted to a proton with the emission of an electron. Remember we said that you always get an electron out when a neutron converts to a proton? Well, one of these neutrons has become a proton. So instead of having six protons, we've now got seven protons. If you've got seven protons, it cannot be carbon anymore because the number of protons determines the element. And the element that has seven protons is nitrogen. There's still the same number of protons plus neutrons because one neutron has simply converted to become a proton. So the total number of protons and neutrons remains unchanged. But you've got this beta particle or electron emitted plus an anti-neutrino. Once again, you might be given this equation with some numbers missing. Let's say that those two numbers were missing and you were asked to calculate them. It's simple, of course, the top must add up and the bottom must add up. So 14 must equal something plus naught plus naught. Therefore, that must be 14. Six must equal seven plus something. Well, six equals seven plus minus one. So you know the minus one must go there. So although you probably won't need to remember these decay equations, you may find yourself presented with them with some of these numbers missing and you have to work out what they are. And remember, the top must always balance on both sides of the equation and the bottom must balance on both sides of the equation.